In this do it step by step video, I'm going to show you how to make this geometric wedding arch using some simple power tools and I will also show you how to calculate the angles you need to make a very strong double rabbit joint. But will it be strong enough to hold my weight? Stay tuned to find out. The geometric shape for this wedding arch is a hexagon, which means we have six sides. You take 360, divide that by six, that equals 60 degrees. And since it takes two sides to make the angle, each angle cut will be 30 degrees. The material we will use is two by six by eight foot long. And this will result in an arch that is six foot 11 inches tall and eight feet wide. It is important to note that the angles you will cut will be a mirror image of each other. They are not flipped. In other words, they do not look like this. It is also important to note the layout orientation of each piece. You will have one exposed end grain and one covered end grain. There are two reasons for this. It helps the hexagon keep its symmetrical shape and provides a location for the pocket holes to be drilled with the grain of each piece. This will make for a stronger joint because it allows the pocket hole screws to engage with the edge grain of the other piece. Now let's see what we need to do this job. If you mind your cuts, you will only need four eight foot sections of two by six, and I highly recommend a miter saw, but a circular saw and a jigsaw will get the job done. A measuring tape, a speed square, a Sharpie or a pencil, and some MDF if you wanna make a template. For the joinery, I am going to use a pocket hole jig set, so you'll need that and a drill. On your first piece of 8 foot lumber, find the center. It should be 4 feet. Then take your speed square and draw a straight line marking the center of that lumber. On that line, measure 2 and 3 quarter inches. This will find the center of the lumber lengthwise. This is important to find because you want to cut your 30 degree angle miter cut at the center of the lumber. That way you save as much lumber as possible without wasting a whole lot of scrap. If you don't have a miter saw, don't worry. When we go to cut the end piece, I'll show you how to use a speed square to find 30 degrees. Once your miter saw is set to 30 degrees, wear the proper PPE and make your cut. Let's make a rabbit joint. Now that we have a shorter four foot section to work with, let's make our first rabbit joint on the uncut end. Again, find the center of the lumber, it's two and three quarter inches, and then draw a straight line. Take your speed square and locate it to the lower left hand corner. While securing it on the lower left hand corner, pivot it to the indication of 30 degrees on the lower edge of the board. Once you find that, you draw a line on your lumber using the back of the speed square. That will give you 30 degrees. A little bonus tip here with the speed square, you can also locate 30 degrees on the 45 degree side of the speed square by indicating 15 degrees when you pivot instead of 30. You can draw your line on the 45 degree side of the speed square and still find 30 degrees. Now you want to measure from the edge to the center of the board on the line you just drew. I measured 3 and 3 sixteenths of an inch. From where the 30 degree mark and the center line meet, measure 3 and 3 sixteenths of an inch on the center line. Now you want to draw the other 30 degree line. Take your speed square and tilt it to 30 degrees on your last measurement. Once you find that, draw your line. Everything left to each 30 degree line is going to be scrap. Using the template I've made out of MDF, you can see the waste that is going to be cut away from this piece of lumber. To maximize the length of the lumber and reduce scrap, we're going to have to move the rabbit joint cut lines to the edge. 
If you don't have a template, all you have to do is take a piece of 2x6 lumber and square it on the ends. Then take your speed square and extend it to that other piece of lumber. That way you can locate the 30 degree angle to the very tip of the lumber you intend to cut. From that point, it's just doing the same exercise of measuring. Find your 30 degree, draw your mark, we add the center line, measure 3 and 3 16th of an inch from that tip down the center line, and then locate the other 30 degree angle and then cut. Again, by doing this, you really maximize your lumber and you reduce scrap. I also recommend taking the time to make a template. It's a lot faster to draw your lines from the template than it is to measure the 30 degree angles using your speed square. Here I'm using the template to trace out our rabbit joint cut lines on the center cut we did earlier. And then I double check it with the measuring tape. I use a circular saw to get the bulk of the lines cut and then I follow up with the jigsaw so I can get a cut that is flush all the way to the inside corner. Once I do that, I take my template and verify the fit is good. Once you have all your pieces cut, you want to choose the side of the lumber which looks the best. That will be the front. The other side of the lumber will be the back. That's the side that will have the pocket holes. Note that the pocket holes are only drilled on one end of each piece. With the pencil, label the back of each piece with a B or an X to indicate that this is the back side. You also have to determine which end will have the pocket holes and secure into the edge grain of the other piece. Once you've made a decision, find a flat surface to where you can lay out your lumber. With the back side up, lay your pieces out with one end grain exposed and one end grain covered. This will help determine where your pocket holes will be drilled. And once you're happy with the layout, number each end of the sides. This way you can put it back together when creating your pocket holes, you want to make sure that you go with the grain. It's very easy to do it if you have a line that's perpendicular to the grain. You simply take your jig, set it up against the end piece, clamp it down, and then drill your pocket hole. For the purpose of this demonstration, I'm just going to hold it down with my hand and not use a clamp. Since I have enough surface area, I'm going to drill two pocket holes for this half lap joint. That was pretty easy and straightforward, but what do you do if you need to create a pocket hole and your end is not perpendicular to the grain? It's at an angle. What do you do? Because if you drill it at an angle, it's not going to go into the joining piece correctly. What you want to do is secure the jig and align it with the grain. Clamp it down and then drill your pocket hole. Again, I have plenty of room so I am going to drill two pocket holes per angle. Once all six of your pieces have their pocket holes drilled, assemble your hexagon and determine which side will be the base. Before we cut the half lap joints on the bottom piece of our hexagon, we have to make our base supports first because we want to test fit the base support on the bottom piece and verify the position before we cut the half lap joints. Each base support is two feet long and is joined with the bottom piece of the hexagon using a simple cross half lap joint. To stabilize my wedding arch, I made two base supports. At the center of each base support, cut an opening that is an inch and a half inch wide and two and three quarter inches deep. From the opening you just cut, measure an inch and a half from both sides. Then draw your two lines. This will mark the starting spot of where your support base will slope to the ends. On each end of the base support, measure up one and a half inches. Then just draw a line that connects the top line to the bottom line. This will give you the cut lines for the slopes of each base support. To determine the location of the base supports, assemble half of the hexagon with the base and the left and right sides. 
Evenly space your base supports and make sure you are not covering or close to the pocket holes on the other side. Since the bottom piece of your hexagon does not have the half flap joints cut out, it will not sit flush to the base supports. Notice how the center of the base piece is not the center of the hexagon. Due to the side that is covering the end grain, the base of the hexagon has now been extended by 3 and 3 16 of an inch. Measuring from the back side of the base piece, I compensated for this by measuring 4 and 13 sixteenths of an inch for the half lap joint near the pocket holes and 8 inches on the other side. Once you're happy with the location of your base supports, go ahead and measure and cut the half lap joints on the bottom piece. The goal is to get the tops of your base assembly flush. That way you know the bottom is also flush. You may have to do some filing and sanding to get the half lap joints just right. By making a good half lap joint, you will have maximum surface area contact with the floor and a very good strong joint to hold the hexagon in position. Also, secure your base supports with pocket holes. Each base support is secured with three pocket holes. Now you have all the pieces to put together your wedding arch. It's beautiful as is, or you can sand the pieces down to prepare it for the finish of your choice. It's really up to you. In the next video, I'm going to show you some tips for what I did when I used the router to ease over the edges, and I will also show you how I made my very own stain with a waterproof satin finish. Thanks for watching. Wait a minute. <laughs> I almost forgot. We wanted to see if this wedding arch was strong enough to hold my weight. Well, unless you are willing to risk breaking your wedding arch, I recommend not doing this. Do not try this at home or anywhere. Thanks for watching, and please leave a comment if you have any questions.